And here we are. It is Wednesday night, the 15th of May in the year of our Lord, 2013. And tonight, I'm joined not only by the effervescent loveliness <laughs> that is Daz, who's standing in for Sav tonight, because Sav's got to be up in Scotland. Um, so Daz is standing in tonight. Say good evening, Daz. Good evening, Daz. He's in, he's in the doghouse over there, little doghouse. No virtuality tonight because he's, he's there. He will cut, he'll pop up full screen. Daz is going to be taking the comments from chat and what have you. But the special guest tonight, and we haven't chatted for a donkey's age live on VTTV. It's been too long. Tonight, the chief executive officer, the president, the madam of S. <laughs> A seat in the, the madam, <laughs> the madam of the seat. The, the in the big monitor tonight, we have the one, the very only Catherine Devlin with a J in the middle. Catherine, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm fabulous, thank you. How are you? I'm all the better for seeing you, my dear. As people who were watching prior to the show properly start, will probably have imagined and gathered. It's going to be a good night tonight, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's going to be great fun tonight. We've got all kinds of stuff to share with you. We've got stuff to talk about because there is some serious stuff that needs to be talked about. But we've, we've got great information between us and it's all good. And it's all going to be on the show that is called VT Talk. <laughs> And we are back live in the room here on VT Talk on Wednesday the 15th of May with Catherine Devlin and Daz, who's looking very, very serious tonight, <laughs> taking in chat. Yes. Um, Catherine, you've been so deeply involved with what's been going on uh, in Europe. Um, I'm just wondering what your take on it is right at this very moment in time. Are you currently, he said, trying to find the right button, a happy bunny? A mediumly happy bunny or miserable as sin? Where are you sitting at the minute? Um, in the dining room. No, I'm uh, <laughs> fairly happy because the work that we've been doing is clearly making a difference. It's been incredibly well supported by the community. Mm. So huge thanks to everybody out there who has made the effort to write to their MEPs and let them know exactly what this means to you and why it's so important because that is really what's making more difference than anything else you know i can do what i do until i'm blue in the face and it's not going to make a blind bit of difference if i'm just one lone voice howling in the wilderness when i'm joined by millions of voices from vapors across europe who are telling the meps what i'm telling them which is you've got to leave these products with these people because they need them then that's when it starts to make a difference. So this united effort that we've got between the industry, the community of, of consumers, the uh, advocates such as uh, representatives like Dave and this show and, and our Y4 radio and all the rest of it from everywhere, that's when it really becomes a powerful force and there's not really much they can do to stand up against that. Yeah, it, it, it is quite interesting because I've, I've been watching this right the way through and it came as a massive shock to me to discover that the CETA is on the... Uh, official list of tobacco industry lobbyists how the not hell did that anymore. happen or has that not been anymore. that's been removed we fixed that i don't know who put that there i suspect that went in there after something that the times of malta did following on from the dali blog that i did all oh, right there was a lot of hoo-ha in the maltese press about the fact that you know i couldn't possibly have written that blog in four hours sorry but i'm quick um that i must have had it prepared beforehand no i stayed up and did it that night um, and that sort of thing. And they, they just got the bee in their bonnet about it and thought, well, this must be the tobacco industry. It's their latest trick. Therefore, this is CETA front stooge organization must be some sort of tobacco lobbyist. But no, we're now registered properly on the EP transparency register as what we actually are. Right. Well, that's that's good to hear because it's it. I couldn't. I'm sorry. My my software is acting up something chronic tonight. I do apologize for this. Try again. There we go. Um, but I couldn't believe it when I saw it because if, which the last thing that a seat would be would be a front group for big tobacco. I mean, I, I've, well, yeah. we've known each other quite a while, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not your style. And it just it struck me as being I couldn't understand why it was there. But there again, no, I, I think over the last uh, the last couple of weeks we have discovered that there's there's been quite a lot 
of disinformation and misinformation flying around Brussels. Would you agree? I th that's a very fair comment, yes. Um, I think that's pretty much nail on the head. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Um, indeed, well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll play the video in. We, we, we kind of launched this on, uh, on Sunday on Dave, Dave's Tattlebox, um, mm -hmm. which, so I'm, I, which I'm sure you'll have seen. Um, but I, I, I make no apologies for playing this in again. This is part of the SWAF campaign, and it's not quite the latest that's come from the SWAF campaign. It's the second latest. I've got another latest one that we'll be playing in, in a little bit, um, probably in the second of the three halves. Uh, but this, this, is, this is basically it's what happened on the 7th of May. Now, Catherine, have you got some good high strength e liquid in your e cig just in case the blood starts to boil? I'm chilled. I've got excellent kit working beautifully. I'm fine. Right. In that case, I think we're safe enough to play it in. Daz has got his brows <laughs> furrowed. He's ready for the onslaught. Um, <laughs> this this came came out on Sunday. Share it. Share it everywhere. The SWAF campaign is working for you and it's working really well. Watch this. <clears throat> I know that people have very strong feelings on this subject, but I hope we all understand that we as MEPs are here to, to, to get the best possible regulation of these products, not to ban them, as is going around a lot on the internet. First marketed in 2004, they are battery powdered and they often are offered with flavors just to favor the consumption among adolescents and other groups. There was a request from MEP to hear some users and we chose the Users Association from Germany because they have the most users of e-cigarettes at the moment. So that's what we're going to do. E-cigarettes are means for enjoyment and stimulation, very similar to a cup of coffee and exist due to their freedom of availability, taste and big variety of flavors. I've, I've read lots of other things that we have an unholy alliance between myself and the tobacco industry. People who know me might think, might think twice about that comment, and also the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the only company that has an e-cigarette approved uh, by the MHRA for clinical trials today, you know who it is? It is CN Creative, owned by BAT, by British American Tobacco. So if you regulate this uh, as a medicinal product, the consequence will be that you will hand the whole business over to the tobacco companies. We therefore believe that subjecting electronic cigarettes above a certain threshold to marketing authorization under the pharmaceutical legislation is an appropriate solution. The e-cigarette is not curing anything, but rather replacing a proved harmful addiction with far less dangerous enjoyment. An easy understandable example, imagine to replace coffee with tea in case you have a weak stomach. Also, you know, I may be cynical, but even salt can be looked as uh, and viewed as a medicinal product because salt can reduce high blood pressure. Are we going to regulate salt as well? Our fear is that there is a time delay in health consequences. Just like with cigarettes, it might take decades before we see the health damage. I'm a professor of public health at the University of Geneva uh, with Ricardo Poloza. I think I'm among the few people in this room who actually conducted research on electronic cigarettes for several years. And I must tell you that the science of electronic cigarettes has not been fairly represented here today. Uh, a number of things have been said that have no scientific basis at all. In 8 out of 10 cases, people report negative symptoms. When it comes to symptoms from the cardiovascular system, a large majority reported negative symptoms from the chest. You cannot represent science by just cherry-picking uh, the negative studies and, and presenting this as science. It's not fair. We cannot continue to subject different nicotine replacement therapies to different regulatory regimes. Currently, we have some products like patches, sprays and chewing gums, others which contain exactly the same active substance, just in a different form of delivery, regulated in a completely different way. So this is clearly not a level playing field. 
I firmly believe that the pharmaceutical legislation is a good regulatory framework for e-cigarettes and would also ensure that these products do not develop into an intrigate for nicotine addiction for young people. Eating tobacco is as dangerous as drinking e-liquids. Nicotine can be synthesized as well and will be the same substance. Or to put it in a picture, Coca-Cola is not coffee. This workshop has been organized to listen to people so MEPs can come to their own view. I, I really wonder, it's not rhetorical, why such a, um, a huge discrepancies between your picture and the one that we catch, not from the industry, the one that we catch, most of us catch from our relations, our contacts with, with, with the consumers, with the users, with les vapoteurs en français, with the vapors or whatever in English, I don't know. My question is though, we all want to see e-cigarettes used to prevent smoking you know, to help people quit. But if it is a smoking cessation product, why can it not be regulated in the same way? With e-cigarettes, you have some things that can make a difference. I've worked in this field for 20 years. I think it can make a difference. If you regulate it as a medication, this will profit the pharma industry, who doesn't want a competitor, big tobacco, who, who are the only ones who can actually comply and eliminate all other nicotine suppliers. Tobacco kills one addict out of two. That's the figure, it's not politics. From the users who have spoken to me, they do not stop their nicotine habit, they stop smoking and they switch to an e-cigarette. E-cigarettes are nothing less than an alternative to the tobacco cigarette. I, I fear that if they are regulated as, as medicinal products, they will not be available uh, uh, as widely as possible and the result is that thousands of people will die. Now that, that was the second latest video out of SWAF, what actually went on. But you were there, weren't you, Catherine? Yeah, we were in the room and I was vaping in the room. <laughs> you were, were you? Um, yeah, and I wasn't being that stealthy about it because at the end of the day, I'm a vapor. And well, I'll be respectful when there are people who deserve respect. Indeed. The... And in that workshop, sorry, there was nothing there that deserved respect. Not what? in the way that was set up. Absolutely all credit to Ricardo Pelosa in the audience, to Rebecca Taylor, to Chris Davis, to Martin Kahnen, to Jean-Francois Etta on the panel mm. for sticking up for E6 and for and Frédéric Ries, of course, for mm. really challenging the schizophrenic behaviour of Linda McCavin. Um, but yeah, sorry, other than that, not much in that room to be respectful of. No. Mind you, I don't know if anybody spotted it, Matthias Gruter, who is the chairman of Envy, when Linda McCavin was bleating on about how, you know, we're not trying to ban these products. This isn't, we're not, you know, this isn't a ban. He stood up and said, at these levels, it's a ban. And then walked out of the room. Indeed he did. Uh, but more, mm -hmm. of, more of the point now, here's, here's the thing. Oh, this blowed software is just not doing what I wanted to do. Right, I'm, you, you've got the screen, Catherine, until I can get this to work. Um, but, okay. Um, during the course of that, did you pick up that um, Ms. McCavan was doing a little bit of a, um, a Maggie, that the lady was not for turning, that this was going to be medicines, medicines, medicines all the way? Not really. Uh, what I was picking up it from in the room at the time was the fact that initially in her introduction to the whole thing, she was on the defensive from the moment it started. Yes. before it had even started and trying to make excuses and, and, and sort of almost bat away the fact that there had been these emails questioning it flying around that morning and being resent. This was Clive Bates had sent an open letter to all of them on the morning of that workshop saying, look, this is a stitch up. It's an absolute waste of time because the whole thing is rigged. It's not going to inform anybody of anything useful. That email that he sent round was then resent to all of the MEPs on that committee by one of the MEPs, Chris Davis, mm -hmm. saying, I agree with every word of this. It was then resent to them all again by Martin Callanan from mm -hmm. a different party, yes. repeating, we agree with every word of this. 
So she must have gone in there thinking, okay, my lovely, beautifully rigged and beautifully planned um, stitch up is now sabotaged before it's even started because people have cottoned onto the fact that I've rigged this. So it was very difficult then for her to try and sit there and say, well, we still think medicines is the best way to go. What she had to then do was allow her presenters to present their slides. And <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm struggling for a word here because information certainly is not the right word. Um, Disinformation. Propaganda. Yes, I'll um, go with that. I'll go with that. Yes. And lies in certain circumstances uh, yes. um, and she she had to let them do that because that's what they'd been mandated to do to do that was their remit they came in they did that and whoopie do and then there was immediate challenges from the floor and it was then a case of right but we want to be seen to be responsible about the risks to the consumers we've got to think about consumer protection we've got to think about public health we've got to regulate this product because of the risks and and then there's people challenging that straight away and saying, okay, what risks? Mm. What regulation is needed? What's the problem with the existing regulation? What, what's lacking here? Why is there a need for us to mess with this? Um, and so I think it was really just a kind of, oh, I don't even know. I mean, it was, it was very entertaining to watch, put it that way. Yes, it, it, it struck me as being a bit of a farce. And I'm seeing that Daz's eyes are doing a salve and dazzling. Dazzling from left to right and right to left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and bring him in. Does what's uh, what's chat got to say at the minute? Well, we've had a couple of comments. Um, <coughs> we get the pretty easy time, but I'm not going to speak too soon because it's early days yet. It is. <laughs> Steve thirty seven UK said um, this is from relation to the video. Said oh dear, not her again. Uh, Winter Rogue says he he the EU put a vid of their own about the TB TPD being nothing more than regulation and not a ban. Uh, MP2012 says maybe they should read the Who's documentation before they set up their joke shop. Maddie Paul has said e cigs have nothing to do with the tobacco industry or pharmaceutical industry. Uh, Rachel Coffey says because there's a vast difference between a cessation product and an alternative. Uh, Glennis, that's why medicine versus consumer product. Mm -hmm. And lastly, Rachel Coffey again says, there were slides, lies, they were lies. More often than not, not even half truths. Some were flat out lies, those who slides. Absolutely, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, completely right there. It's interesting, though, that out of all of this, there's been backlash in various different areas. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about Italy just at the minute. But that's, that's going to come up in the second half. Italy's coming up in the second half because what's come out of there, a question that's come out of there has blown my mind because it really puts the tin hat on the whole thing. But I need to bring in another camera. Camera six. Work, you swine. It's working. Good. <laughs> now, you, you might recall that, and I want to run through Rebecca Taylor's amendments as well because they make a lot of sense to me. Um, but she's been on the ECHA website responding to what a blog post that was put up there. And I'm not going to go through all of it. In fact, I'm just going to read the penultimate paragraph because it makes interesting reading. Um, and this is the bit. I'll even try and highlight it if I can't. Dink, dink, dink. There you go. In any case, it says, if the workshop was designed to get MEPs to support the pharma industry position as you claim, I don't believe it was, then it utterly failed. As even, now listen to this, as even the rapporteur, Mrs. McCavan, has now decided that the medicine's route is inappropriate. Let me read that again. Mrs. McCavan has now decided that the medicine's route is inappropriate. And, 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 and I, I think I probably need to go no further in that paragraph than that. I'm going to read it again because it makes me feel so good. It says, <laughs> the rapporteur, Mrs. McCavan, has now decided that the medicine's route is inappropriate. Um, chair dance. <laughs> Without a, what do you make of that, Catherine? I mean, seriously. <laughs> well, I can, I can actually tell you a, a, a bit of, of, I mean, it's not, not sort of revolutionary, but I do know for a fact that on the day of the workshop, we actually met with um, one of the MEP's assistants straight after it. And we were discussing amendments and so on. Because uh, we'd obviously, we'd submitted ours as a draft because a couple of the MEP's had asked us for it. And um, 
in fact, what, what we've seen happen is that they've taken the amendment that we drafted and improved on it mm. in ways that I wouldn't have even thought of. So I'm, I'm enormously grateful to them for that. Um, but a lot of what we were suggesting has been included and, and is, is, you know, in there now, which I'm really pleased to see. Um, but what was fascinating to me on that day was the fact that we were told that they, the NB committee guys had not yet looked at the jury opinion. Mm hmm. And that they would be looking at it over the next couple of weeks. Now, I can't help but think that if you're going to be the rapporteur on the committee that is leading this directive through the parliamentary process, when the opinions come in from other committees, particularly if that other committee is jury, tasked with, you know, minding out for the legal affairs, and particularly when the rapporteur from that committee is a qualified lawyer, mm -hmm. That opinion comes out and says there is no legal basis for what you're trying to do. Surely, as the rapporteur for the lead committee, you would want to pay a little bit of attention to that and perhaps consider that opinion in the round and look at it, perhaps in a bit of detail, before proceeding to do anything with your progressing of that directive through its processes. You would have thought so. And apparently that's not what happened, but I, what I think is likely to have led to Rebecca's comment, which presumably comes from something that she's heard from Linda McCavan herself or associates thereof, um, it strikes me that she's probably read that opinion by now and has recognised that, surprise, surprise, reclassification as a medicine is inappropriate, illegal, unsustainable, undoable, and would never, ever stand up to challenge. It, so, it, it, yeah. Congratulations on finally getting to common sense. Yes, it's, uh, if, if, if that indeed is the case, if Linda McCavan has seen the light, like I said, chair dance. Without the shadow of a doubt, it's chair dance time. Everybody <laughs> chair dance. Um, I'm going to go into the adverts, and when we come back, Daz, I'm going to come straight back to you for uh, uh, comments from chat, because I have the feeling that chat might be chair dancing as well. There's some good music in the adverts. Chair dance to them, because I'm going to... This is... I'm... I'm, I'm a little bit thrilled it's going to be a good short night. I'm really enjoying this. It's going to be good. Into the adverts, back in two minutes. Chair dancing all the way. Here we go. in Yorkshire for your ACP needs. That's iVeber.co.uk and iVeber-elixir.co.uk iVeber and iVeber-elixir.co.uk are proud sponsors of VeberTrails.tv And, and, and apparently Catherine's been kicked out of chat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know why I did. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we haven't got Glenis Wilmot as a moderator. But why, why, <laughs> was, why we try to sort that out? Daz, what we got coming in from, uh, from everybody else? Okay, well, the latest comments that we've got is um, Daz from Safe Six is Safety catches back on, lads. Cue the damn busters music. Oh, not yet. <laughs> Uh, Jeff Bedian said she's decided to ban nicotine as a dangerous poison to save the bees, question mark. 
<laughs> Keith Hunt uh, says, the way things are looking, they're just going to end up turning the clock back by 15 years and turn all ex-smokers into smokers again. If, if that's not a public health issue, then I don't know what is. All these EU politicians blind... Are, sorry, I'll start that again. Are these EU politicians blind as well as stupid? Maddie Paul has put disinformation slash propaganda equals political terminology for BS and lies. Rat Finks has said, if it's not medical, it doesn't leave anywhere else much to go, so it could be an outright ban. Mark Shaw says, I wouldn't trust my cabin if she said Christmas Day is on the 25th of December. Cindy Lanning um, is asking if anything was said about flavours. And also MP2012 has said, Kath, are you implying that MEPs have a smidgen of intelligence? Well, there's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I'm sure, well, I'm positive some of them have because some of them have been singing from the right hymn sheet is, is probably the easiest exactly. way to put it. Um, that is the point I made, that actually some of them have been phenomenally, um, uh, you know, on the ball. Uh, Rebecca Taylor from the outset set out to inform herself, honestly, without an agenda. Yes. And Chris Davis jumped on very quickly and, and got in touch with consumers and found out the facts for himself. Mm -hmm. And Martin callanan has been talking since from the very beginning. Yes. So some of them do have intelligence. Others, yeah, not so much. Well, now, it's funny you should mention that because it kind of brings me on to something else that I've been thinking about for a while and, and not to, not to uh, kind of digress too far. But one thing I will say, though, that it's interesting to see that chat or the people that uh, the messages that we pulled out kind of share my little bit of cynicism. I mean, I'm chair dancing because I don't think Rebecca Taylor would post something that she didn't know to be true, but I'm still not 100% convinced that Linda McCavan is, is actually where it would appear she is. And I'm sure that there's a subtext there somewhere, but it'll be interesting to see how it all pans out uh, because the jury committee, when they finally ratify, if they ratify the draft and that goes through, that changes all the cards, doesn't it? I mean, that, that's a ray deal. Uh, that's a bum deal from the start. You can't do it as medicines. Perhaps she's been convinced of that. It'd be interesting to see. Um, but mm. you, you were mentioning, Catherine, that, the, that there are um, MEPs who have yet to be convinced of the rectitude of the hymn sheet from which we sing and from which Chris Davis and Rebecca Taylor and Martin Callanan and uh, uh, Matthias Gruter and... Uh, Frederic, I'm trying to name check them on. It was dead easy at the beginning of this too. Now there's a list that's getting as long as your arm of people that you need to name check that are actually singing off the right hymn sheet. But I have a list of names of people that need to be contacted to be properly informed so that they can read the words on the hymn sheet, the right hymn sheet. And, and in no particular order, uh, Carl Heinz Florence, for instance, probably could do with further information. Um, Mancini, could do with further information. Peter Lisa, uh, Dagmar Ruth, Roth, Ruth, Roth, spelled R O T H, and Joe Rot. Rot. Okay, that's that's the best way of saying it. Um, and Joe Lennon. The problem is, of course, none of these are British MEPs, and I think most of them are part of EPP. Are they not, Catherine? Yeah, I have written to all of them um, several times. I've given them quite a bit of information, but obviously tried not to drown them in it. Mm -hmm. Um, Karl Heinz Florence is obviously a very key uh, figure on the EPP party, and consequently, he has had a bit more information than some of the others. Uh, he's actually had a complete um, copy of the ISC, mm -hmm. the Industry Standard of Excellence, as well as the Collated Scientific Research and various other bits and bobs. Um, so, we've been trying to, to reach these guys to inform them. Ultimately, we can only meet with people who will agree to meet with us, but we're, we're getting to as many as we can and have met with us a, a lot. Um, but if they refuse point blank to meet with us, there's not a lot we can do about it. And um, there's also the, the situation where some of them are less relevant to it than others. So Dagmar Roth, for example, uh, as far as I'm aware, she's not a key player in this. So when she refuses a meeting, it's like, well, okay, fair enough. She hasn't really got much to contribute to this debate. She'll just do a vote based on, frankly, what her colleagues tell her. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Right. You know? Um, so it's it's a case of trying to, to kind of make some sense of, of, of who is key and who is not. But we've written to all of them. I mean, I've written several letters to every member of jury, every member of Envy, every member of IMCO, mm. um, as I'm sure you have. So <laughs> oh, yes. the, the letters are going out there. But 
yeah. So, yes. and I know Clive's writing to them all. I know Jerry Stimson's writing to them all. I know um, uh, there are other other sort of players across Europe who are writing to all of them. Jack Ruzek, so, you yeah. know, they, they, they are getting the information they need. It's just whether or not they can actually see it for what it is. Indeed. Well, there is one bit of interesting gossip, though, that I could share with you if you want me to. Go ahead. I love gossip. I mentioned this to you earlier earlier today. Mm. This, is, this is pretty much just rumour and gossip, but it's quite an interesting one. Because it seems, we're hearing on the grapevine, that the EPHA, which is the European Public Health Alliance, which comprises organisations like the European Society for Cardiology, the ESC, the ERS, the European Respiratory Society of Professor Grazio Notoriety, mm-hmm. um, and all of those sort of NGO groups, and uh, let's just leave it at that. Yes. Uh, um, they apparently have been talking fairly intensively over the past couple of months about the fact that actually they're going to need to move their position on electronic cigarettes mm. because it flies in the face of, of common sense and public health goals to be anti e And it sounds as if there's discussion around the fact that they're beginning to recognize that. Now, obviously, that puts them in a bit of a difficult position, having sort of nailed their colors to the mast, Glenis Wilmot Stiley in coming out forcibly with all sorts of misinformation against e mm. But it, although obviously... In time for the workshop, they weren't able to to realign their position and, and change their tack. It wasn't part of their remit for that workshop, after all. Um, but apparently those discussions are going on. So we may see a significant tidal change in the position of the, the uh, NGOs, the public health NGOs. I'm just going to call them that. Yes, it's, it's very, very wise to keep it at that. I think so. What, 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 we're, what we're talking about here, though, really, is um, European... Not, not so much UK, but mainland Europe outfits that have based over there, really. And it got me to thinking uh, uh, over the last two or three days. Uh, we, we've had um, Jacques Leuzek from France on, on VT Talk, as you know. Um, and, that, and that was all cool, but all done in English. And I'm not sure that that would serve the French people all that well. And, and I'm sure, you know, we could get um, German advocates for e-cigs uh, that, that, that have all of the right background and, and, and letters after their name and all the rest. But again, it would be in English because I'm English. And what I'm minded to do, and, and I, I, I'm just going to throw it out there and see whether anybody thinks it's a good idea. We've got a little bit of bandwidth that we can use for this. And it occurs to me that if I could drive ashore from here and Skype in, three or four people from say let's do a show in german with a german present a german host whoever um with whoever it is they need to get there to, to be able to discuss what they need to discuss to get to the likes of carl heinz florence and peter lisa and what have you we could do that we could host that i, I wouldn't be on it we could do it at seven o'clock on a wednesday leave an hour to, to get everything back together for the English show. If people think that's a good idea, I, I, I don't know. I'm just going to throw it out there to see what folks think. We could do that with, with the Germans. We could do it with the Italians. We've got to talk about Italy before the night's finished. We've got to talk about the Italians. We could do it, you know, we've got plenty of time because this is not like, this is only a skirmish, not a skirmish. What is it? We've moved two pawns, basically, and we've got a bishop under pressure and we've got you know the king might be in check but this is by no means the end of the game we've got a long long road to go i I'm, i don't know i mean does what's chat saying are they coming back and thinking that might be a decent idea to go with if yeah know? chat is uh, they're in full support um it's basically a resounding great idea dave apart from jeff bennion's asking if you'll do it in a mankini oh jeff <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that everybody seems to be in full support um, I, I hope you don't mind as well. Something's literally just come in from Cliffy uh-huh. uh, to ask you to see what Kath thinks about the MHRA position would be if the EU <laughs> decided not to make E6 medical. Um, well, yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk MHRA. I think in in the third segment of the show uh, because it is quite important. But no, no, Catherine. Before we go any further, the MHRA position is not what you thought it was. <laughs> no, stop that. No, I'm just laughing at the, the MHRA crying in their coffee. That's all. I'm not being kinky. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah. 
you'll have to draw I me a picture. It's hugely entertaining, hugely entertaining that one of the people on that panel at the workshop that was supporting us was Jeremy Mean from the MHRA. Yes, I, I got that impression. Really but yeah. I just find that hugely entertaining. It, it is. It's, it is quite. But we'll 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 kind of come back to that in uh, in the third part, I think. So if if people are up for that, if we've got anyone from Germany or France or well anywhere anywhere in Europe, please get in touch. You There's can... people offering the help on. Uh, I mean, I've just seen Thomas's name. Um, Thomas's name come up, and I think he's going. He he's offered the help out as well, Dave. So it's big I thumbs up about German it. Interview, you? Say that again, Catherine. Sorry, he could do German interviews for you. Yes, I think that would that would be brilliant. Um, just just tweet me, Skype me, whatever. Get in touch. We'll get it. We'll we'll sort the logistics out and get it all sorted out. And if we can do it, why not? Let's do it. Let's let's kind of get everybody knowing what they need to know in their own native tongues, and and we can go from there. Because with the best will in the world, I can read stuff and I can spout it. But I, when it comes to uh, actually speaking it off the top of my head, I'm I'm no good. Uh, je ne suis pas bon. That's French, you know. I can do French ones for you if you want. <laughs> je, je suis très crap. That's what je suis. Um, let's let's kind of hit these amendments from um, from Rebecca Taylor. I don't know whether everybody's seen them. I know you have, haven't you, Catherine? Oh, yes. Um, and and I tweeted earlier on that I could get behind these, and I, I'm, we can run through them one at a time or not. But kind of the important ones are uh, pretty much as follows. He said, discovering. Seriously, this software is up and down like a hand and horse draws. Right, there we go. We've got it up. Okay, this is um, from Christian Engstrom, Christopher Fjellner, Rebecca Taylor, and, and Chris Davis as well. Um, and the first of the amendments says that blah, 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 all of the, the legal stuff, safety and efficacy of medicinal products, including nicotine con pro containing products, which claim to have properties beneficial to human health. A significant number of nicotine containing products presenting such claims have already been authorised under this regulatory regime. Member states are obliged to ensure nicotine containing products which do not fall under Directive 2001-83 EC and which are placed on the common market comply with the appropriate legislation listed in New Annex 4. Right. This is brilliant because new Annex 4 is a list that I believe you pulled together, Clive pulled together. We've, we've kind of worked on this list of all of the current bits of regulation that e-cigs fall under. I'm not going to scroll to it because that's what's there. What that paragraph means, basically, is if CN Creative want to put a medicinal e-cig on the market, they can, but they've got to jump through the medicines hoops in the meantime, everybody else that makes no health claim that just says, he's an e-cig, buy it if you want it, use it if you've got it, can carry on pretty much as they are. Is that your reading of it, Catherine? As they are, but subject to the existing regulations. It is vitally important Absolutely. that manufacturers comply with the law. Indeed. And as long as they do that, it is incredibly difficult for policymakers to justify, uh, well, it's almost impossible for them to justify uh, further regulation than is already there. Indeed, and you just just in that rather nice succinct list. Yes, succinct. It's not succinct. It's as long as your arm. You've got to jump through more hoops <laughs> and soft mix hard hot dinners. Let's just read the justification for this, and I'm not going to put it on screen because the software's acting up. It clarifies that a two-track approach should be taken regarding nicotine containing products. Those which do not fall under Directive 2001-83 EC have to comply with the broad range of legislation listed in new Annex 4. It's brilliant. Um, labelling provisions, it says. I'm going to try it. Let's see if we'll get there. Yeah, we did. Um, labelling provisions should be introduced for nicotine containing products falling outside of the scope of Directive 2001-83 EC drawing the attention of consumers to potential health risks and member states should be obliged to ensure that national age restrictions for buying nicotine containing products are kept in line with those for the sale of tobacco products. Again, all good, there's the justification. This is a level playing field between age restrictions for the sale of nicotine containing products 
and tobacco products which should be maintained so as to discourage miners from taking up either product for the first time. Let's blast on through them while we're here. Nicotine containing products that are presented as having properties for treating or preventing disease in human beings other than through any message specified in paragraph 3 may only be placed on the market if they were authorised pursuant to the medicines directive. In other words, if it's a medicine, it's got to be a medicine. You look, what, what's that look for? Wow, Dave, you've turned into a Dalek. Have I? Yeah. <laughs> I can't hear a word you're saying properly. I'll, I'll, two seconds and I shall sort that out. I can, Ooh, I, wow. I need to just unplug myself a little while. That's because, for whatever reason, Please don't say exterminate. That's quite scary. <laughs> that should have sorted it out now, has it? Oh, that's better. <laughs> that that believe it or not, that was just something getting the wrong um, the wrong data rate. Anyway, it's sorted now. Right. What okay. it, what it says is this makes a medicines marketing authorization mandatory if a health claim is made using strictly the definition in the medicines directive presented as having properties for treating or presenting disease is quoted from the first part of the medicines directive definition of a medicine. In other words, you can't mess about trying to do this blood plasma malarkey and psychophysiokinetics and all the rest of the gobbledygook. Oh, that... Didn't you love that suggestion though, that they were going to lurk outside e-cig shops and wait for someone to come out having bought an e-cig and say, hang on a minute, we need to take some blood and check your plasma levels. Because that was going to be really easily enforceable, wasn't it? Well, absolutely, and I mean, I can just imagine what, uh, whoops, I can just, oh, come on, David, get it right. I can just imagine what somebody like Jeff Benyon's reaction to that would be, and it would, would roughly translate, it would be go forth and multiply, you ain't sticking a prick in me, you swang. Um, but yes, I, they, they, these, these amendments, I sat and read, when first I read through them, I thought, hang on, we're still going to be regulating here, and I quite like the jury approach of getting rid altogether. But the more I've read through it, and they're there for everybody to read online, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to go too much further through all of this. But it seems to me that what Rebecca Taylor and Christian Engstrom and, and uh, Fjellna and, and Davies are proposing protects e-cigs throughout the EU. It actually protects them. Because it means, and this will lead into the adverts and into talking about the MHRA quite nicely, it means that the MHRA cannot, under EU law, just put a blanket classification on e-cigs as a medicine because the EU says so. Daz, I'm going to come to you quickly before we go to the adverts. You've got, I don't know, let's call it 30 seconds to run through what you've got there. <laughs> okay, then. Um, <clears throat> I'll have to miss out on some then. We'll um, pick them up after. Okay, Carulian C says these amendments are very, very clever. Um, Mark Shaw said, so really they are offering a stick for them to carry on beating tobacco industry with as they are the ones most likely to make health claims. Seabiscuit said, so far the news seems to be getting better. I better stop practicing my celebratory Snoopy dance. <laughs> and finally, Kronos has said that Catherine's giggle is so infection, infectious and it needs a medical authorization as a stimulant. <laughs> Oh, you've, you've never been accused of that before, have you? <laughs> I like that one. I like that one. I'll have to get a health one and put it across the bottom of your screen. Caution, Catherine Devlin is a stimulant user at your peril. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Dear God almighty. Does Tom know? <laughs> I'm not going there. Stop it. I will not be drawn into this. No. Look at that. Poker You're face, not going to catch me. No, we'll not. We'll not. We'll go into the adverts. We're we'll back in two minutes because I want to. I want to kind of cover Italy. We've got to cover Italy because it's made me giggle left, right, and centre. Actually, blows the tin lid off the whole thing. So we'll be back in a couple of minutes, right after these adverts. Enjoy.
And we are back after those adverts and much hilarity about Ms. Devlin being a stimulant. We'll, we'll go no further than that. We'll, we'll just not take it any further because it's unfair on both of us because if we both start giggling, that's it, show's gone. But I am, I am, I'm going to put this on screen now, assuming it works. I hate this software. I hate this. If anybody from Strata is watching, it's crap. Sort it out. Right. Turn into a Dalek again, please. <laughs> that, was that, that, that wasn't the software. That, that, was, that was something different. Right. Italy. Now, what happens in, in the European Parliament and the commissions and what have you is occasionally MEPs ask questions of the commission. And I'm going to read one that was posted by Giancarlo Scotta from Italy. And I'll put it on screen so you can read it. And it says, I wish to put a question to the council regarding an issue which has recently been attracting a great deal of interest, but which has never been addressed from the point of view set out below. I am referring to electronic cigarettes, devices considered to be nicotine containing products, which therefore fall within Article 18 of the proposal for a directive of the European Parliament and of the Council on the approximation of the laws, regulations and administrative provisions of the Member States concerning the manufacture, presentation and sale of tobacco <laughs> and related pro Oh my God. Anyway, right. The consumption of traditional cigarettes provides the Member States with sizable revenues as a result of the substantial taxes to which they are subject. I'll read that bit again. The consumption of traditional cigarettes provides the Member States with sizable revenues as a result of the substantial taxes to which they are subject. According to a recent report by ANSA, the Italian news agency, of 21st of April 2013, in the first two months of 2013 alone, Italy's coffers registered a loss of 132 million euros, corresponding to a fall in revenue from duty on tobacco of approximately 7.6%. Of course, this shortfall cannot be completely blamed on the increasing use of electronic cigarettes, but it is certainly partly responsible. In light of the above, can the Council state what action it intends to take to address the differences in tax revenue materialising in state coffers following the proliferation of electronic cigarettes, which currently appear to be free from any form of duty? That's what that says, he said, pressing the right bloody button. Oh, it's lost it altogether now. Right. People are about to see what happens when I bang a new piece of software up. This is all going to be fun. I do apologise for this, everybody. Catherine, while I'm bringing this software up, can you uh, dive in on that and just tell everybody what levels of duty already apply to uh, e-cigs coming into the EU? What, what did vendors and, and, and everybody have to pay on these things? Right. Well, there's a huge amount of tax revenue currently <laughs> as consumer products because uh, at the moment they are subject to VAT at 20 percent. Medicines are exempt from VAT. Mm -hmm. They're subject to import taxation. Medicines are exempt from import taxation. Um, they are providing uh, employment with PAYE taxes for employees. Um, they are paying national insurance contributions as employers and the employees are as well. There's also obviously corporation taxes. So there's actually, it's a massive money making machine as well as creating significant economic growth during a time of, you know, widespread global recession. I mean, nine out of 17 of the member states at the moment are technically in recession in the Eurozone. Yes. Sorry, not just member states, but in the Eurozone. Nine out of 17 are, you know, officially in recession. And yet this industry has seen consistent growth of around 30% month on month for four years. And it's showing no sign of slowing up. So that's an enormous amount of tax revenue. And I imagine you can probably break that down better than I can. It's, uh, it's incredible. I mean, when you think about it, when you look at it, by the time you've taken in duty, VAT, um, corporation tax and all of the other taxes it amounts to between 65 and 70 percent of everything that we pay for e-cigs ends up going pretty much to the to the uh, to the revenue to the coffers of, of any country and if as I predict within 10 to 15 years 65 to 75 percent of all nicotine users will be using e-cigs and not lighting tobacco 
that represents a sizable chunk of money and the savings that the NHS would make because apparently health is what it's all about would be enormous but it, I just think it's so telling that it took an Italian who are they're not very inhibited are they they're fairly un, an, an uninhibited race it took an Italian to actually come out and ask the question that we've all thought was behind it all from the very start it is it seems all about the money and I can't wait to see what the written reply to that question is going to be. <laughs> the next question of course is, and we said we'd cover this and I, and I would I would love, what what do you think the MHRA is going to be able to do now because I know you talk to them fairly often, where are we standing in the UK? Are, are their hands as tied as I feel they might be? Well Fundamentally, the answer to that question is is pretty obvious because, as we all know, which is why we're all talking to Brussels all the time and writing to MEPs, this decision is being made in Brussels. At the moment, we are part of the European Union. Okay, there's big hoo-hahs about discussing that 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 may change, but there's no sign that that's going to be changing within the next four years. They're talking about potentially changing that and pulling out of the EU after four years in the next Parliament. So it's not going to be anything that happens quickly no so for the foreseeable future this decision is resting in brussels so really the mhra is largely irrelevant in that they don't have a position from which they can dictate what happens with this subject because this legislation is being made in brussels yes i must admit I'm so that that's one side of it yes the, sorry but the, the next bit of it is the fact that if the mhra does want to try and do something for the UK, even as an interim measure, while this goes through in Brussels, there are procedures that they have to follow. Right. And as you, some of you may have read the, the blog uh, that I wrote about the MHRA failing to plan mm -hmm. and therefore planning to fail, mm -hmm. the point is they have not followed any of the procedures that they would need to follow if they were going to bring in a different kind of regulation for e-cigs or any kind of reclassification for e-cigs um, anytime soon. So. If we just look at bold facts, never mind hunches or instincts or anything like that, if we just look at bold facts, A, this decision is being made in Brussels, B, they haven't followed any of the procedures to bring in a new regulation for the UK, the only conclusion I can draw from that is that the MHRA has nothing to say. Right. I'll tell you, the bit that worries me is that they do seem fairly um, willing uh, and I'm not sure how able, but they do seem fairly willing to go jumping off the precipice and do something anyway, just for giggles really, to see what's going to happen and then see whether or not it gets taken to court, possibly even to test the waters. And I would, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm very, very suspicious of what's likely to happen down there. And I would urge everybody to not just contact MEPs and, and for God's sake, this has been a very, very positive set of information and it's been great to bring it. Um, but this is by no means the end of the journey. Um, we've got an awful long way to travel. We've still got to keep on top of it. We've still got to keep the Council of Ministers on their toes because they can do pretty much what they like. All right, they've got to fling it back to the European Parliament, but we do need to keep on top of them, don't we, Catherine? Absolutely. Um, all of the letters, keep on writing all of the letters to your own MEPs and to any that you think need targeting. We're going to Kat's already messaged me via, via Daz. We're, we're going to try and do something about the German shows and the French shows and what have you and, and try and bring all 7 million of us together. Because there's about 7 million in Europe, isn't there? Somewhere yeah. there. Seven and rising all the time. Yeah, so I mean, even if it's not 7 million a day, it will be by this time next week. It's bound to be because we, we are growing in numbers all the time. So we want to get everybody talking to their MEPs, singing off the same hymn sheet, and let's, let's just not let them think we've gone away, that we've gone quiet, that we've become complacent because we can't afford to do that. And we need to bring our own MPs in on this as well. We need to be talking to them and getting them to talk to Jeremy Hunt and Anna Subri um, to get, get them on board and make sure that, 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 that the right information is getting where it needs to be at the right sort of time. Um, we know we've got some MEPs and political parties on board and I'm... I'm Tempted to play the Jeffrey Bloom thing in. What do you reckon? Should we do that? I'll tell you what, let's throw it to chat and see what chat's had to say. Um, because that I always find interesting. So what have we got, Daz? What, what's, what's chat saying at the minute? I can imagine there'll be quite a lot. Yeah, there is quite a lot. Um, let me just get my page up here. 
So Moonlit said 15 paragraphs, 83 footnotes and an appendix or two just to say what a normal person would say in three lines. <clears throat> Rachel Coffey said, in short, we got a lot of money from taxing smoking. Smoke tax revenue was down 7.8%, resulting in a loss of 132 million euros. E6 may be resulting in people smoking less. Can we tax E6 more to make up for it? Keith Hunt says it all comes down to money in the end. Uh, he also says, what about the savings the NHS are making from not spending the money they would normally spend on treating all the people they would be treating if we were smoking and not vaping? Mm -hmm. Funny Tricks that said, just stick more duty on tobacco to cover the shortfall. We'll never go back anyway. Uh, Rachel Coffey again has said, mind you, even if the MHRA had the power to decide this, they cannot lawfully declare non-medical products taking no medical claims as medicines. And the last one, Keith Hunt again says, that's one of the arguments, isn't it? The EU want people to be healthy, live longer, but ultimately that costs more money, takes up more resources, etc. It's not really an answer, is it? It isn't. It's not an answer at all. I mean, I don't, I don't know where they're going to go with this. I just find it very interesting that it's finally been brought up and that it kind of does tell the story. I do think that it's going to put the tobacco control people right on the back foot because it's kind of opened up the can of worms. They, the, the antis, if you want to call them that, the anti-tobacco and anti-e-cigs people, make a very nice living thank you out of doing what they're doing. But I think now it's been shown up that actually they're on a gravy train and I think they can see that gravy train running into the buffers. And I have to say, that doesn't upset me even slightly. Chair dance time, without a shadow of a doubt. If, if that train's running into the buffers, I'm going to be such a happy boy. Because I think everybody knows, I don't care whether you smoke or you don't smoke. It's entirely up to you. It's, uh, it's your situation. Catherine, I'm going to give the last word to you because we haven't spoken for a donkey's age. Um, what's the next step for a seater? And, and I'm sorry we didn't cover e-juice tonight. We were going to do, but we'll have to leave that for another day because it's been too nice a day. I don't want to go there. E-juice? What? What? I don't know. It's the stuff you put in an e-cig. Apparently it makes them nice. Okay. Yeah. Did you not know that? Yeah, well, I just stick with the menthol. It's pretty boring. Oh, no, not menthol. Not you as Yay. well. No, no. Disgusting. So what, 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 what's the next step? What, what, what's his seat to do and what does his seat to need consumers to do in order to keep this thing going forward? Keep writing to the MEPs. Write also to the MPs in the UK because we have been meeting with the UK government and they are alarmingly uninvolved in this process um i mean it, it it's enormously frustrating to me because i i you know they, they bleat on about wanting to have a say in brussels and and the fact that brussels is sort of faceless and they don't have any power over there and all the rest of it they're not even trying to and that's really frustrating they need to know that this is a significant issue affecting their constituents the people who vote for them mm -hmm. and that they need to shift their asses and get over to brussels and tell the european union what the UK's position is on this. And they need to do that in a very clear um, and firm way. Indeed. Because it's all very well to sit back and bleat about, oh, we've got no control over Brussels. Well, you, you can't have any say in the discussion if you're not having a say in the discussion. They need to know that they need to go there and make it an issue for the UK government to take a position on. They need to know that, that voters are going to vote on this issue in their millions and that if they want to, to have a hope of, of being re-elected and having their, con their continuing careers, they need to look at this issue properly. They need to inform themselves and they need to go and make a stand in Brussels and, and take a UK government position and take it to Brussels. You know, because whether we like it or not, and I don't come down on either side of this argument at the moment, but whether we like it or not, we are part of the European Union and this decision is being made in Brussels for the UK. Yes. So, so the UK government ought to be taking a position on it to Brussels. And the best and not at the moment. The best way we've got to make them do that is by us getting in touch right. with our MAPs. Write right. to them, Definitely. go to their surgeries, talk to them, do whatever it takes. And not just the MEPs for Dave, but the MPs, MPs as well. MPs, MPs go MPs to their surgeries. Well. Yeah, exactly right. Go to the MPs, talk to them, get them right to them, do the lot. We've run over time and I do apologise to Chris. I'll get my head and my hands to play with. Um does Thank you so much for standing in for Sav tonight. Uh, I'm no sure problem. she appreciates it, and I do too. Catherine Devlin, thank you so much for joining us and, and joining in what's been, for me, a very uplifting show. It's been nice to share the information that we've been able to share. Things are going in the right track. Let's not let them stall. 
from me, from Kat, from Daz, from everybody here on the VT TV team. Thank you so much for tuning in. You are the important people in this. Yours is the voice that's being heard loudest and longest. Use it wisely. Get out there. Do what you need to do from all of us here until we see you next time. Night-night. Take care. Vape on. Vape hard.